Hello everyone and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret and we are currently in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 9 and we resume our study in verse, verse number 9. So get your Bible, open it up to Mark 9 verse 9 and we will begin right after I remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com study the Bible in its entirety using my audio Bible messages at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Click and listen. That's all you have to do. Genesis through Revelation, three complete series found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Father, and we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark 9, verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, the mountain being the Mount of Transfiguration, where Peter, James, and John were on that mountain with Jesus, and he lit up like a neon sign. From the inside out, the glory of God shown through Jesus and Moses and Elijah appeared to them, appeared to Jesus and started talking to him. And uh, But they came down from the mountain, they couldn't stay there and we'll find out why. They came down from the mountain. He charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were raised from the dead. The apostles saw some great things on that mountain amazing things, exciting things, things that they would love to talk about, I'm sure, but they can't do it, at least not right now. No one is going to hear about Jesus lighting up from the inside out and the glory of God shining through him. No one is going to hear about Moses and Elijah appearing on that mountain. No one will hear about Almighty God, God the Father, coming down in a Shekinah glory cloud and speaking out loud that Jesus was his son and that we were to listen to him. Nobody's going to hear about those things. Not until after Jesus was raised from the dead. Good things all. But it's going to be delayed. Because sometimes, always remember this, sometimes good things are delayed in the will of God. <clears throat> Verse 10. And they kept that saying to themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. Notice they didn't question Jesus about that. They talked about it among themselves. They did obey. They kept the matter to themselves. They decided that they wouldn't tell anyone about those amazing events on the mountain until after Jesus was raised. Then they looked at each other and they scratched their head and said, wonder what in the world being raised from the dead means. Because they didn't think Jesus was even going to die, even though he told them. Which reminds us, by the way, that we do not need to know all the details about God's plan, plan or all the details about his command before we obey him. They didn't understand what it meant. But they obeyed Jesus anyway not to talk about it. You don't have to understand all the details of God's commands to obey them. It is enough to obey what we know God has commanded. That's enough right there. And verse 11, <clears throat> and they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elijah must first come? In other words, Jesus, it seems to us that the Bible is being fulfilled right before our eyes. They were confused about what was going on here. Um, the apostles were probably thinking we know that the Old Testament predicted that, the, that Elijah would return to prepare the way for the Messiah. Now, 
if Jesus is the Messiah, and the apostles know that he is, and he's there, and they just saw Elijah on that mountain, they're probably wondering, why can't we tell everyone about it? Jesus is the Messiah. The Old Testament said that Elijah would come before the Messiah. We just saw Elijah. We know Jesus is the Messiah. Why can't we tell, tell people about this? Scripture's coming to pass right before our eyes. Why does all this have to be kept a secret? I think Jesus will explain it. Whether they get it or not, I don't know, but look at verse 12. And he answered and told them, Elijah verily cometh first, and restoreth all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man, that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt. So Jesus is trying to get them to understand that he has to suffer and die and be raised from the dead before he can establish his kingdom on earth. He wants them to get that. In other words, you can't tell people about Elijah and me and the kingdom or they will believe that it's going to happen immediately. See, this, this scenario never entered into the apostles' mind. This is the first they ever heard of such things. Jesus is saying, Elijah, Elijah will come first before I set up my kingdom. But then he reminds them of the scriptures that predict that the Messiah must suffer and die for our sins, too. Both are Bible. Both are true. Elijah will return to earth, and the Messiah will set up his earthly kingdom. Those things are very true. But that truth does not cancel out the other scriptures that predict that the Messiah is going to suffer and die and be raised. All in its good time. Don't jump ahead. All these scriptures will be fulfilled. The Messiah coming, the Messiah dying, the Messiah being raised, the Messiah coming, being preceded by Elijah, the Messiah setting up his kingdom. It's going to happen. And we learn from this, though, that it is not right, and it is, in fact, dangerous to pick and choose which scriptures we will believe and proclaim. Picking and choosing is not an option when it comes to the Word of God. That's why I teach the whole counsel of God from Genesis through Revelation. And there are certain things in the Bible that I do not try to reconcile because God has not revealed those things to us yet. You just teach them as they are and you trust that God will reconcile them in His good time. Just like See, the religious leaders of our Lord's Day, they picked and choose what verses they wanted to believe about the Messiah. And that's what they taught. And they excluded the others. They didn't like the verses that taught that Jesus was going, or that the Messiah would die for the sins of the people and then be raised from dead. They didn't want to think about that. They just wanted to think about the verses that taught that the Messiah would set up his earthly kingdom. You, you should not pick and choose. They didn't know how to reconcile those two things, so they picked one and they went with it. And people do that sort of things today, that sort of thing today too. That is dangerous. It's not good at all to pay attention to the scriptures that we may like while ignoring the ones that we don't like. The entire Bible is true. Every one of the 31,000 plus verses in the English Bible are true. They're all the Word of God. The entire Bible is true. The entire Bible must be taught as fact, even if we lack understanding of how it will all work out in the end. That's not our business. Our business is to teach the truth and believe the Word. And let God figure out the how. And I can tell you this, one way biblical heresies come about is from overemphasizing certain scriptures while ignoring other ones. 
And again, that's why I teach the whole counsel of God from Genesis through Revelation. And if somebody, if somebody sends me a question and says, Mike, could you explain how you can reconcile the free will of man and the sovereignty of God when it comes to salvation or anything else? I uh, write them back. I say, no, I can't. God has it figured out, but I don't. And I'm not going to try or I'll get into heresies. Mike, can you tell us, please, how God can be one and three? No, I cannot. But the Bible teaches it. So I teach it. And we'll let God figure it out. And if he wants to tell us someday, he can. If he doesn't, that's okay too. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. 13. But I say unto you, Elijah is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they desired, as it is written of him. So this, this is, if you think it's tricky up until this point, this is where it really gets tricky. Because Jesus is referring to John the Baptist when he talks about the Elijah who has already come. He's talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist preceded the first appearance of Jesus Christ, and by doing that, he fulfilled the prediction concerning the coming of Messiah in, or coming of Elijah in a spiritual way. However, someday, not John the Baptist, but the real Elijah, John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, doing the same work that Elijah did, and he preceded Jesus' first coming. So he fulfilled the coming of Messiah in a spiritual way. But the real Messiah, or the real Elijah is going to come and precede the return of Christ at the end of the age when he returns and sets up his kingdom on earth. And, and if, you can't, if, if that hasn't sunk in, just leave it be. It'll sink in someday. Don't worry about it. 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. So Jesus and his disciples no sooner come off of that mountain and they got trouble. They no sooner hit flat ground and they run into trouble, big trouble. And I imagine Peter's idea of staying on that mountain is probably sounding like a pretty good idea to them right about now. 15. And straightway, all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. Oh, they were so happy to see Jesus. The crowd was thrilled that Jesus came off of that mountain. The nine who Jesus had left at the bottom of this hill tried to help, but it didn't happen. They couldn't do it because there is no one like the Lord Jesus Christ. And this crowd has learned that. The nine apostles who remained at the bottom of the hill tried hard. No doubt they were all well-meaning, but they were not Jesus. They couldn't, they couldn't meet the needs of these people. We try to be good Christians if we love Jesus, but we are not Jesus. Jesus never fails. And even though we Christians hate it, we still sin. 16. And as he asked the scribe, and he asked the scribes, Jesus asked the scribes, what question ye with them? In other words, Jesus asked the religious leaders, why are they, why are they arguing? Jesus asked the religious leaders why they are arguing with his disciples. 7. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, who hath a dumb spirit. So this devil had destroyed this boy's ability to speak. This boy was possessed by a devil. And he took away his ability to talk. And we see from this that Satan and his devils are only interested in hurting people, in ruining their lives. And even when Satan gives people some of the things that 
they desire, it's only because he knows that in the long run, it's going to hurt them. The devils don't like anyone. Devils work to destroy everyone. And if you get them a foothold in your life, whatever part of that life is, they'll ruin it. Just like they ruined this boy's speech. 19, 18. And wherever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spoke to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And remember, the disciples had recently returned from a ministry tour where they had cast out devils and cured diseases in Jesus' name. They came back triumphant, reporting to Christ on all these things that they did. So, I mean, that was the buzz. And in light of that, I suppose this father brought his possessed boy to his disciples with high hopes, but they couldn't make the devil leave. And they couldn't figure out why. Worked before, not working now. 19. <clears throat> Jesus answered them and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I endure you? Bring him unto me. On a scale of 1 to 100, Jesus' faith and love for Almighty God scored a perfect 100 all the time. Consequently, it must have been difficult at times for him to be around those who were so far below him spiritually and morally. And he kind of expresses that a little bit right here. I can't wait till I get home to my father, basically is what he is suggesting. 20. And they brought him unto him. So they brought the possessed boy to Jesus. And when he saw him, when the devil inside of this boy saw Jesus, straightway the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. When this devil saw Jesus, he knew that his time and that boy was just about over. So what does he do? He hits that boy hard. He plummets him. He tortures the boy as hard as he can before he loses him entirely. Devils are not stupid. Devils know when their time in someone is just about up. Devils know when a person is moving in the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ. They can see when they are in danger of losing a soul to God. That's why they pull out all stops to keep that soul on their side. They'll work on that person's mind and try to cause confusion about their sin and Jesus, or sometimes they will try to distract that person away from Christ. They will do whatever they possibly can to keep them from coming to Christ when they know that they are close to losing them to Jesus. They don't give up without a fight. That's why often many, many prayers are needed before someone, before some people finally submit to Jesus Christ. There's a spiritual battle going on for their soul. 21. And he asked his father, how long ago is it since this came unto him? And he said from a child, that poor boy, Satan had stolen this boy's childhood while the other children were playing he was being tormented from the inside out by a devil. 22. And often it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. The father is so discouraged by the failure of others who have tried to deliver his son and failed that he's not even sure that Jesus can do it. If thou can, he said. 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And of course, some people will take this verse and say, See, you can have anything that you want if you only believe. 
So that's where the word of faith heresy in part comes from. Mostly from their greedy, self-centered hearts. But this is the verse that they use out of context that they twist to back their ungodly, unbiblical doctrines. You can have anything if you want, if you only believe. But Jesus did not say you can have anything you want if you only believe. He did not say that. He said all things are possible if you believe. Not all things are a sure bet if you believe. Christ, Because Christ is not going to do anything that goes against his word or his eternal plan, no matter how hard one believes it's going to happen. You're not sovereign. The word of faith people are not sovereign. The word of faith heretics are not sovereign. God is sovereign, and he doesn't give that sovereignty up for anyone. The Bible teaches that God is sovereign. That should put the word of faith people and their teachers in their place immediately and should show to you and will show to anybody who knows the scripture just how wrong they are. Keep completely contradicts the Bible. Just that part alone does. 24. And straightway, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. The poor dad, he is desperate. And since faith is one of the keys to receiving from God, just one, but it is one, he wants help in that area too. He asks God to help him. He believes in Jesus somewhat, the best he can, but he admits that his faith is not perfect. He has imperfect faith, but he has a willing heart. He's willing to improve in that area, so he asks for help. The most, the most important thing that you and I can offer God is a willing heart. He can work through us if we have a willing heart. Verse 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. The problems of this poor boy and his father were no one else's business. There was a crowd of people around there as usual. But this problem was no one else's business. Consequently, Jesus works fast to get rid of that devil before the crowd arrives. And we learn from this that some things should be kept between us and God. Some things are no one else's business. 26. And the Spirit cried, and convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he was like one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. Jesus got the devil out, but it looked like that devil killed the boy before he left. 27. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. So whether, whether this boy had been dead or seriously injured, Jesus brought him back. One thing is for certain, Jesus undid the damage that the devil did. Jesus can undo any damage that devils do to people. Totally reverse it. Mary Magdalene was possessed by seven devils. And Jesus delivered her from no doubt a life that must have been entrenched, engrossed in the most immoral behavior possible, possessed by seven devils, delivered her, changed her, saved her soul, turned her into one of the most loyal people that ever followed Jesus on earth. And it doesn't matter how deep you are in sin. God is so easily able to deliver you if you want it. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus can undo any damage, damage that devils do to people. He can and has, in many cases, not only reversed the damage, but used it for good, too. Like with Mary, I think one of the things that made her so dedicated to Christ was the fact that 
he delivered her from such a miserable, wretched existence. She never forgot that. 28. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? It seems as if their failure bothered them, and I'm sure it did because they cared about Jesus. A Christian is bothered when they fail Christ. Peter wept after he denied Jesus three times. Paul referred to himself as the chief of sinners when he thought about his life before Christ. Why? Because these guys loved Jesus. They loved God. And sometimes the closer we are to Christ, the more we feel like a failure. The more we care about Jesus, the more our failures will bother us. 29. And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Spiritual warfare is one on our knees. The tougher the battle, the more we need to pray and fast, which is a powerful form of prayer. Let's go to verse 30. And they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. Jesus is on his last trip through Galilee on his way to Jerusalem, where he will be crucified for our sins. And for that reason, he wants more private time with his disciples and less public time. 31, for he taught his disciples and said unto them, the son of man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And after he is killed, he shall rise the third day. And this isn't the first time that Jesus told his men that he would be murdered. But this is the first time that he mentioned he would also be betrayed. God gives us as much truth as we can handle at the time. He gives us a little more here and a little more there. He gives us truth in increments because we couldn't process it all if he gave it all to us at once. 32. But they understood, they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. They didn't understand why he would have to die and what really, I'm sure, didn't make sense to them is that it would happen as a result of a betrayal and he already knew about it. They didn't understand why he would have to die, especially when he knew about it ahead of time. How can a betrayal succeed when you know in advance that it is coming? Well, normally it doesn't, does it? Obviously, the element of surprise has been removed. And so they don't, they don't understand why the Messiah has to die anyway, and they don't get it, and, and they don't like it. And so they decide that they don't even want to talk about it. It's unpleasant. Let's not talk about it. Actually, they're afraid to talk about it. When there is bad news, sometimes people like to pretend that it's not there that they didn't even hear it. I didn't like what I heard, so I'm not going to think about it. I will not deal with it. And that would be all right if it got rid of the bad, but it doesn't. Pretending doesn't change reality. Instead, it prevents one from responding biblically, which in turn just makes bad situations worse. But we're dealing with reality when we study the Word of God verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. That's what I'm doing. And you can do that anytime you want to at the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Begin in Genesis, go all the way through Revelation, study all 31,000 plus verses of the Bible with me using my audio Bible messages or study any book of the Bible you want to study in any order you want. Whatever you want to do, just get in the Word. It's the most important thing you can do. And God will bless you. He'll change your life. Meanwhile, as you are studying, please remember that I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. As I have said many times in the past, this is a faith ministry, and it has been for over 30 years. So 
I need your prayers and financial support. Click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord leads. Thanks.